The second important class of chemical reactions that we look at in chapter two is acid base reactions. And so we're going to need to define what we mean by an acid and a base before we can look at how those two things react with each other. So we define an acid as a substance that produces hydrogen ions when it's dissolved in water. And we talked about that when we were um, looking at um, chemical nomenclature. So um, acids are um, covalent compounds. When um, they are used to form aqueous solutions, that aqueous solution will um, be composed of hydrogen ions and an anion. Now, what is a base? Well, a base is a substance that when dissolved in water produces the hydroxide ion. And so um, a very a common um, class of bases are metal hydroxides. Now, not many metal hydroxides um, are particularly soluble. So bases tend to be um, hydroxides of the group 1A metals. So these are ionic compounds, right? So when a metal hydroxide is dissolved in water, it'll form the hydroxide an an anion and some kind of cation. So this definition of acids and bases on the basis on the um, potential of um, the compounds to produce either hydroxide ion or hydrogen ions when dissolved in water is called the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases. So it's important to realize that a hydrogen ion is simply a proton because what is a hydrogen atom? It's a proton and one electron. So if you take away the electron to generate the ion, you're left with just a proton. Now, a proton is the most dense unit of positive charge that you can um, have. And protons um, interact very, very strongly with water molecules. And if you recall from chemistry 139, water molecules have a negative end at the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atoms are the positive end of a water molecule. And these um, protons that are formed by acids interact very strongly with the negative end of water molecules. In fact, so strongly they form a covalent bond to the water molecules and form what we call the hydronium ion. So in aqueous solution, protons are always present in um, water as the hydronium ion, as the H3O plus polyatomic ion. So what is actually happening when an acid is dissolved in water is this, is that a proton moves from our acid molecule to the water and becomes attached to the water, forming the hydronium cation. And that leaves behind an anion. And both of those species will end up becoming dissolved in the water. Now, it's also important to recognize that people will often, instead of writing um, H3O plus AQ, they'll just write as a shorthand H plus, and it's kind of understood that whenever we have an H plus that is AQ, it's always going to combine with water to form the hydronium ion. So, you know, chemists get a little lazy, and but you kind of get used to it. So, in this sort of a scenario where we write the proton moving from the acid to the um, or the water molecule, we can think of a um, this reaction as being a proton transfer reaction. And the proton donor is the acid in this case, and then the proton acceptor is described as being the base. And this is the beginnings of our definition of an acid-base reaction. So. There's this thing called the Bronsted-Lowry definitions of acids and bases, and what we have in this in this definition is that an acid is defined as a proton donor, like the HCl molecule in this example, and the base is defined as a proton acceptor, which in this case is the water molecule. Now, the proton acceptor doesn't have to be a water molecule, so now we can have acids that don't have to exist in the presence of water, right? They just have to exist in the presence of a proton acceptor. So this is a little bit of a extension of the erroneous definition of acids and bases. Okay. So there are some um, Bronsted-Lowry bases, that is proton acceptors, that are not ionic compounds are not those soluble metal hydroxides, but rather they are molecular species. And the most well-known example would be the ammonia molecule. 
So what happens when ammonia um, functions as a base? We take some ammonia, it's actually a gas, and if we bubble that through water, what will happen is the water will function as an acid and donate a proton to the ammonia to generate the ammonium ion and leave behind the hydroxide ion. So most bases that we see in biological molecules um, are of this type. They are molecular bases rather than um, ionic compounds, those sol soluble metal hydroxides. So you've probably heard of a DNA bases or a DNA base pairs, and now you know where the name base comes from. These are molecular species that function as proton acceptors. It turns out that they all contain the nitrogen atom with three bonds on it, just like in ammonia. Okay. So one thing that we'll talk about when we're characterizing acids and bases is their relative strength. And the strength of an acid and base is not related to its reactivity, but rather it is related to the extent that the species separates into ions in an aqueous solution. And it's a pretty simple kind of definition. Strong acids 100% completely dissociate, as do strong bases. And then weak acids and also weak bases, they dissociate very little when they're dissolved in water. And it's important to um, make the distinction between the concentration of something and its strength. Concentration is how many moles per liter. Strength is the extent of dissociation. So they're kind of colloquially, they might have the same meaning. Similarly, strength is not necessarily related to um, reactivity. So there are some weak acids, and a good example of this is hydrofluoric acid which is a weak acid because its molecules dissociate very little, but it is highly reactive and extremely corrosive. In fact, it's famous for being able to eat through bones. Okay, so let's have a look at um, some categories of acids um, in terms of strength. And so what are the classic strong acids? Well, we have these three binary acids here, uh, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid. So these are also called the hydrohalic acids, um, and they are all strong, those three there. Note that hydrofluoric acid um, is, is a weak acid. Okay, and then you'll see that there are these oxo acids that are strong. And how we know an oxo acid is strong is that the number of oxygens is two or more greater than the number of hydrogens. So nitric acid has two more oxygens and hydrogens, so it makes it strong. Sulfuric acid also has two more oxygens and then hydrogens, and perchloric acid has three more. So that puts it into the category of being strong. So what are your weak acids? Well, there's hydrofluoric acid is in a special category by itself. And then there are these um, oxygen oxo acids that don't have enough oxygen. So if you see here that um, phosphoric acid, it only has one more oxygen and then hydrogen. So it doesn't meet our criteria for being strong. And then the other big class of weak acids are these acids here, which are the carboxylic acids, where you have some group of atoms, and then it all, the formula always ends in COOH. All of those guys are weak. Probably the most famous um, weak carboxylic acid is acetic acid, which is the acidic component in vinegar. Now, when we look at bases, what are your stereotypical strong bases? Well, they're all of your um, soluble metal hydroxides, right? They're all your soluble metal hydroxides. So these are all ionic compounds. Now, according to our solubility rules, most um, hydroxides are insoluble, and the exception is for group 1A, 
um, medals and also for the larger members of um, group 2a now some of these have pretty low solubility right so some tables might have these guys listed as being insoluble your classic weak bases are um, things like ammonia they're molecular bases and they generally contain nitrogen with one lone pair on it and then three things bonded to it just like we see in ammonia so you can easily recognize our strong bases they have hydroxide as part of that formula and they're obviously ionic compounds they begin with a metal okay so what happens when an acid reacts with a base well what happens when, when is proton transfer the hydrogen ion formed by the acid reacts with the hydroxide ion formed by the base and we make h2o now when we when an acid forms um, hydrogen ions it's going to leave behind an anion and when a base forms hydroxide ions it's going to leave behind a cation and then that cation and anion can combine to form an, an, an ionic compound so if we look at the molecular equation for the reaction between a stereotypical strong base such as sodium hydroxide and a stereotypical strong acid such as hydrochloric acid we can see what happens here the proton combines with the hydroxide anion and that forms water and then the anion from the acid combines with the cation from the base and they form an ionic compound so this is often summarized like this we say acid plus base gives a salt and water and by salt we just mean ionic compound so generally what you have to do when you're balancing one of these reactions is you want to ask yourself what is the ionic compound if you can figure out what this is then you then you're on your way to being able to balance an acid and base reaction and then we know that the other product is always water okay so um, recall when we were talking about precipitation reactions we said there are a variety of ways of writing an a equation when we have things that separate out into ions in the molecular equation um, between a strong acid and a strong base we leave everything in its undissociated forms even though we have an understanding that these compounds might exist as individual ions when they're dissolved in water now note water molecules do not dissociate at all but this aqueous solution of sodium chloride we know in reality that it is present as aqueous sodium ions and aqueous chloride ions similarly this strong acid we know in reality that it's present as hydronium ions and chloride ions all right we know that that's really what's going on and similarly with the sodium hydroxide here this is a soluble we know it's soluble because it's labeled aq it's an ionic compound it's a strong base and it actually exists as sodium ions and hydroxide ions in a one-to-one -one ratio so just like we did when we were talking about precipitation reactions we can write this in a more realistic manner where we dissociate all of those compounds that dissociate 100 percent into their individual ions now I should point out here that if uh, we have a weak acid and we don't get 100% dissociation the convention is not to dissociate that weak acid now this is a strong acid so we will dissociate it into the individual ions so this can be dissociated into hydride ions and chloride ions and also we kind of understand that hydrogen ions don't really exist as um, H plus ions but rather they are hydronium ions but we're not going to um, write them out longhand so we break all of our AQ species that completely ionize into their individual ions we do that all the way across the board the water is not an ionic compound so we leave it intact and when we do this what do we get we get the overall or total ionic equation right so this is the overall ionic equation 
Okay, and so similar again to what we saw with precipitation reactions, we can see that some of the ions in this reaction are in the same, same form on both sides of the arrow. So these chloride ions are in the same form on both sides of the arrow. So they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. They're not, they're not in any way reacting. Similarly, with these sodium ions, they also are not reacting in any way. These are called spectator ions. They're unaltered on both sides of the arrow. They're not undergoing any meaningful interaction with anything else. So one thing that we can do is we can go ahead and cancel these guys out. And then that leaves us with what we call the net ionic equation. And so in our net ionic equation, we only have a couple of things left in this case. We have hydrogen ions combining with hydroxide ions to form one mole of water. Now, you want to be aware, and we saw this previously, that if you end up with coefficients that can be reduced at this point, you'd want to go ahead and reduce them by dividing by the lowest common multiple. Okay, so um, that's a good example of, um, how, of how acid base reactions work and how we write the equation for an acid base reaction in the three different forms. Now, I would like to give a more complex um, example just to illustrate that not everything is always quite so simple. So what I'm gonna look at is the reaction between this strong acid H2SO4 and the base strong base barium hydroxide. So what's going to happen here? Well, the first thing to recognize is that this guy dissociates to form two moles of hydrogen ions and one mole of sulfate ions. And then this guy is going to dissociate to form one mole of barium two plus ions and two moles of hydroxide ions. So that's what's present. So what do we know is going to happen? We know that the hydrogen ions will combine with the hydroxide ions. And when they do that, they're going to make two moles of water. So the products of this reaction will be 2H2O-L. But now, what about the, um, the barium ions and the sulfate ions? Well, they're going to combine to make a, um, an ionic compound, right? They're going to combine to make an ionic compound. Now, the tricky thing about this that you have to recognize is whenever you're thinking about the ionic compound that is formed, you want to be thinking about the ratio of the ions but also you want to be thinking about is that ionic compound going to be soluble or not? Now, barium is a 2 plus and sulfate is a 2 minus, so they're going to combine in a 1 to 1 ratio. But when I consult my solubility rules, I realize that barium sulfate is insoluble. Okay, insoluble. So I always have to check whether my ionic compound is soluble or not before I kind of finalize and um, what the label on it's going to be here. So putting all of that together, when barium hydroxide reacts with sulfuric acid, what gets formed, what gets formed is two moles of water and one mole of barium sulfate solid. Now I have to make sure everything balances. I've got four hydrogens on the top here, four hydrogens, and then four hydrogens on the bottom, so that's good. I've got one barium on the top. I've got one on the bottom. That's good. And then I could go through and tally everything up and you would see that it really does balance. So what I really wanted to point out is that it's not always a one to one to one to one ratio of acid to base to ionic compound to water. That's the important thing. It's, that's one important thing. And also to keep in mind that sometimes your ionic compound is insoluble and sometimes it's going to be labeled as being AQ and you need to check that or you won't be getting um, your four points when you're doing your homework and your quizzes. Okay, hope you found that helpful. 
um, there's one more video on this section concerning redox reactions and that's a little trickier and so make sure you leave plenty of time to have a look at that guy.